Okay, hi everyone. Um, all right, hi Alana. Uh, would you like to just briefly introduce yourself to everyone? Sure, hello everybody. So my name is Alana Wilcox and I am a fiber artist. Um, I'm also an instructor. I am a spinner, a knitter, a dyer. Um, I dabble in lots of other fiber art things like weaving, um, embroidery, quilting, felting, like I love to do it all. Um, but the thing that I'm the most passionate about is, is spinning and dyeing and, and working with color. That's, that's really where, where my heart is at. Awesome. All right, so we'll just jump in with the first question, which is when did you start spinning and why? All right, so um, I've, been, I've been at it for quite a while. I would say in 2005, was when I first had the idea of, um, that, that spinning was possible. And it started because at the time I was heavily into crazy quilting. So if you would like, I can, I can show you the, the piece. Oh, okay, so, Absolutely. So over here. Okay, I hope you can, can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. All right, um, so, so over here, I have like one of these squares that I've been working on. So this is also one of my longest um, work in progress projects. This is, this is over 20 years old, um, wow. but, but if you notice over here um, on one of these little like cracks and crevices, I have a little embroidery that doesn't really look very, um, I want to say exacting of what, what it might be, but it's, it's actually supposed to be my cat. His name, his name was Oscar and he's curled up sleeping, holding his tail. And so <laughs> I have a photo of him or I had one, maybe it fell off, but I can, I can um, show you a picture of him a little bit later on. But um, I really wanted to, to capture um, his fur in this quilt. So this, this was a very special quilt that I, I started um, because I, I saw in a class that I was taking um, at college at the time, so I was like 19, um, my, my American literature um, professor brought in a crazy quilt and she shared it and I just thought, oh my goodness, this is, you know, just an amazing, an amazing thing where you can combine both fabric and threads and beads and I was just completely like, you know, smitten with the process and so every one of these blocks has like a special, um, you know, idea or message behind it. So like on this little piece here, my husband is Christian and I'm Jewish. And so I made this as like the centerpiece. So I made the little like Fimo Christmas lights and, you know, the little, um, you know, um, applique of the, the Christmas tree and stuff like that. My, my husband is big into frogs. So I got these little beads here. I found them like these little Fimo frog beads and stuff. So, so every, every piece of this quilt that I was working on had, had memories and stories. And actually, um, I brought it with me when I was studying in London and, and I got so many of these things from, what was it, what, what is that department store in London? Like John something? John Lewis. John Lewis, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got, I got a lot of pieces from there as well. So that was a very fond memory um, that I had. But specifically, I wanted to know if I could turn the fiber of my cat into, into yarn and so to, to embroider it. And so I was taking um, a natural dye workshop from um, this, this local museum. And they basically had this like expert, you know, weaver, dyer, fiber artist lady teaching it. And so I said to her, you know, I'm doing this quilt. I would really love to incorporate my cat's fur. Can you give me any information about how does one go about taking, you know, fluff and turning it into yarn? And so she suggested that I go to a local spinners guild. And then upon doing that, um, you know, I brought this um, grocery bag filled with, with cat fur um, to this meeting. And I was kind of looking around, you know, a little bit uncertain. And, and of course, you know, when you, when you go to a guild or a group of um, fiber people, and you're like wanting to know if something is possible. There's there's always a couple in the crowd that will just kind of like jump on top of you and be like, yes, yes, we can teach you, we can teach you. And I was like, no, I didn't want to do it. I want to know if like it's possible. And they're like, yeah, well, we're gonna show you how. Um, and so I've always been really fascinated with the the tactile quality of of feeling fiber, you know, 
uh, allowing twist to go into the fiber and watching it transform into yarn. And so literally, as soon as I learned how to spin, I didn't finish the quilt <laughs> because it was it was such a, um, a a powerful experience to have that that tactile experience. And so um, this year, <laughs> like I said, 20 years later, it's actually my goal to finish this quilt. So I have a ton of these blocks, you know, when, when we're done at the end, if you'd like me to go through them, I'm, I'm more than happy to, but, but yeah, um, it was just, it was just a magical experience turning my cat's fur into yarn and, and here we are. Wow. That's awesome. Go from like, that's an interesting introduction into spinning because I think that's the most unique start and spinning story I've heard so far. Like I've never heard of someone being like, I want to know how to turn my cat fur into yarn and that's how I got into spinning. It's always been like I want to know how to make yarn just because I'm already a knitter like people are already in the fiber industry fiber craft world from something else and then they kind of move into spinning. I've never heard of someone um, especially coming from cat fur <laughs> to spinning which is awesome. Um, yeah and, and, and what's interesting too about that is that you know I did know how to crochet and I did know how to knit but I wasn't um, like, I didn't know anything about pattern reading, right? So I just knew based on what my grandmother had taught me. So when I was a spinner and everything that I do as a spinner, it comes from the yarn construction, um, I guess like thinking. And then I've had to learn how to be a knitter, like okay. through that, how to be a weaver through that and how to be a crocheter through that. And so I've made so many mistakes in making things because I just thought, well, I can make fiber stick together and be cohesive as a yarn, but how can I make it functional? And so I know that like as part of this whole, you know, fluff to stuff, it's that transition, right? So I can get to the yarn phase, but then when I want to branch out and do stuff with it as yarn, um, I fall in on my face like a lot, a lot. And so I just think it's interesting that when a knitter starts spinning versus a spinner starts knitting, you know, that there's um, a different experience that people might have in, in doing that. Yeah, it's interesting because like you said, if, when a knitter starts spinning or a crocheter starts spinning, they're kind of spinning with the idea of having something that they could then knit or crochet afterwards. So they know what they're gonna, you know, I say they know, they have an idea that that's what they're gonna use it for, that it's not just gonna sit there as yarn, indefinite well yeah maybe indefinitely for some of us but anyway um whereas when a spinner you're spinning and then you've got to learn how to knit as well then yeah it's kind of it, it's a completely different um learning curve essentially which is really fascinating is again because it's not my experience it's very interesting to hear about it um Okay. Oh, and by the way, we had lots of comments coming up about how that uh, quilt is kind of like a scrapbook of your life, which is awesome. I think that's such a um, fun, fun quilt as well. Like it's a really fun project, even though it's taken you 20 years, it's kind of like, well, it's incorporated 20 years of experiences. Um, okay. So the second question is, what do you enjoy most about your spinning now? And what do you find most frustrating? Well, I think now, so, okay, so like I said, I started in 2005, so, you know, we're, we're, we're quite a ways away from um, when I began, but I don't know if you can see, so I'm going to try very carefully not to tip my camera over too much, but if you look up over there on top of my cabinet, wow. all of those binders are homework assignment binders, okay, and so um, in, in 2007, I started um, on the path to becoming a master spinner. I went through the OHS spinning certificate program and that was about 250 hours every year in homework assignments, okay? Wow. And so um, it was a considerable amount of, you know, sampling and swatching. And so I can show you, I have, um, you know, these gloves if you'd like to see, they were um, my year one final culmination project. But in going through the, the program, it really allowed me to know everything about yarn construction, right? And then in completing it and in exploring knitting, crocheting, and weaving, um, I've gotten to a point now where when I have an idea in my head, I can execute it. And I think that that is the most, I don't know, the, the, the most joyful place to be as a fiber artist because so many times there are things that will frustrate us, will make mistakes, you know, and um, it might make us give up and quit. And so for me, I'm at a place now where when I have an idea in, in my head, I can, I can really execute it. So this is 
um, one of the, the projects that I did for the course, okay? And so what was really awesome about these gloves, I also have a book that goes with it. So if you give me a second, it's up over here. Okay, so you can see um, what actually went into these gloves. Um, but for the year one, the focus was on woolen spinning, on working with a grease fleece. Um, everything had to be dyed. So this is when we did acid dyeing and um, just everything from start to finish. This was, this over here is a Cormo fleece. And so I'll just take out the um, tabs in this binder so you can see it a bit better. But like over here, you can see, right? So this is this wow. is like the grease, you know, wool that I started with. Yeah. And then, you know, I I washed it and then I dyed it and carded it. And then um what I what I loved about this project specifically though, and I can put up the picture so you can see too. This is this was my inspiration photo. And so it really started me on this journey of trying to see how can I match colors from a photograph, okay? And so once, once I attempted that, um, I tried pulling, you know, all these different like um, colors from the different pixels of the, of the photograph. Um, I dyed them over here so you can see, you can see that and I'll, I'll even pull out the little samples. You know, so there's, there's a lot, a lot that went, you know, into yeah. this, the documentation, um, and just really the thinking about it, right? Like how do you organize something from beginning to end? And so in, in doing this, while it seems like, you know, it's a lot of work and, and yes it is, um, it really helped me get to a point now where when I have an idea in my head, I can, I can execute it um, with great success, but know that that came with a ton, a ton, a ton of mistakes. Yeah, but it's also like you've got so much experience now in terms of how to break down a project like this to then know like what's the first step how do I work up to getting to that final project it's um yeah it's incredible yeah so I would say that that's probably the the thing that I love the most um about spinning now and one of the the last projects that I did was um a shawl that I dubbed the the Wizard of Oz shawl and oh, so I it's, this on Instagram it looks wonderful yeah it's hanging out behind me um and so that to me was my first real attempt at combining an idea or a concept with my fiber creation or my yarn creation. Um, and so I really want to explore ideas more now. So not necessarily, you know, following the pattern from start to finish, but, but how when I create my yarns, can I communicate an idea or a message? And I think that when people see things like that, it just, it makes the experience of looking at it, wearing it, touching it, talking about it, all of that, just more, you know, hyper exaggerated, right? It just makes it more enjoyable. And so to me, the whole process is, is joy. It's, it's yeah. about joy. Absolutely. So what do you find the most frustrating about your spinning now? Or have you figured all of those frustrating things now and it's all joy? Well, you know, um, for me, this, this is quite interesting. Um, I'm, I, I never knew this about myself, um, but, but my son, um, you know, a few years ago, he was diagnosed with ADHD. And so um, it's something that is hereditary. And I, in the past few weeks, um, I actually am going to see if I'm gonna be diagnosed for it as well, because I feel like with, with ADHD, I didn't know that someone can hyper-focus on something as well as being distracted by things. And so I've so hyper-focused on spinning and dying that I'm at the point now where um, if I run into a mistake, it's going to be in the knitting component or the weaving component, but the yarn part I got down because like I've, I've been so tunnel visioned on, you know, yarn and like everything about it, you know, that I'm, I'm at the point now where it's actually um, the other things about it that I might make a mistake on or get frustrated by, but everything that I do is um, a very like question driven process, right? So like, um, right now, like I'm, I'm doing your, your um, changing lane socks. Oh, yay. So I'm, I'm almost done with them. I'm almost done with them. So um, let me, let me go over here just to show you. Okay. So with this one, right? Like, so this is like one sock. And then this is the other sock. So this one, I didn't quite finish it yet. So there they are. But over here, 
is the wool that I dyed for it. Now, I've never worked with um, a down fiber before. Okay, so I, I, dyed, I dyed the fiber up. And what's interesting about it is that I wanted to see, you know, what, what would it be like to work with this fiber? And I don't, I don't like working with down fiber, right? But I'm committed to the process because I wanna see, is there a point, like if someone says to me that down fiber is good for socks, I wanna know why are they saying that? You know, like what is their experience with it? And so I really didn't like the, um, the, the prepping of it. It's very coarse and I'm, um, very like tactilely driven. So, you know, of course I'm driven to these like soft, you know, 14 and a half micron or less, you know, Merino, that's my, that's my, um, you know, wheelhouse. But, but it's, it's been very interesting in seeing the whole process from start to finish. And when I'm touching these socks, even it feels wiry, but as soon as I put them on my feet, they feel so squishy and comfortable. And so I don't, I don't want to allow um, the, the process to get derailed, even though there might be parts about it that I don't enjoy. So I kind of like weigh the pros and the cons, but I love to see things through to completion because I feel like there's, there's just something very rewarding about, you know, not liking something, but sticking with it and, and just seeing, you know, the, the results that may come of it. And, and I love, I love um, the way that, you know, the, the colors are playing out. So in the pot I had, a section of, you know, um, lighter greens. And then I had these like medium tone greens. And then I had these browns. And so what I did was um, I carded them up. And so it's gonna fade. So the middle part is gonna be this, this green. So it's gonna be like light to medium and then medium to dark. And so it's gonna have this like um, color shift. But because I was able to create a pair out of one color shift, um, when I'm done, I'm going to do a giveaway so that people that do enjoy using the suffix, <laughs> they can enjoy the fluff and just to pass that joy along, you know, so yeah. um, I'm trying to do this thing that that I'm, I'm calling it my two for one in 2021 challenge where I'm trying to finish two work in progress projects before starting a new one. And then whenever I finish a work in project of work in progress, then um, I'm going to do a giveaway. So this, so this fiber is going to be part of the giveaway that I died in prep. <laughs> That's wonderful. And I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I'm kind of like, once I start a project, it, I, I kind of get a bit stubborn about it, even if I'm halfway through and I'm not necessarily enjoying it as much as I thought I might. I'm like, no, I don't want to give up now. Like I want to see it through because like you said, even if you're not enjoying the process in the moment, you might, you're still going to learn a lot from it. And the end product might be something that you actually want in the end. Um, Grace is pointing at her knitting. Um, but yeah, like you said, like once you put the socks on, you realize actually they're really comfy. So um might be worth it to get to the end. Yeah, because if I was using, if I, if I just stuck with that 14 and a half micron um, merino for everything, right? It just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, give me the results that I want at the end. And I'm, so I'm a very um, product driven spinner. I really like to have something in mind. And then I like to do like a kind of a backwards design or like start from the end and the beginning. Yeah, because I feel like um, while there is joy in just spinning for fun, I know a lot of people enjoy that. Um, but for me, I want to know, like my time is so precious. And I, I did this like breakdown, so not to be funny about it, but I did this breakdown in my The Organized Spinner Workshop where I said, you know, because I've done so much documentation of time for the spinning certificate course, I figured out just by timing one project, right? Like if you've never done this before, this is my challenge to you. Start a project and then document how much time it takes you to do it literally from start to finish, okay? Um, so you might find that, for example, to knit a pair of socks takes you 30 hours. And then to spin for the socks maybe takes you 20 hours. So now you know, right? Like your spinning time, you know, based on the ounces that you spun, the knitting time based on the stitches, how much you can accomplish. Now, some people might say this is a morbid thought, thought but I'm gonna say like, let's say generously, I'm gonna live to like 80, 85, okay? Um, in that window of time, how many socks could I accomplish if let's say every night I have 30 minutes or an hour to work? Now, again, this might be a morbid thought, but you know, it is the reality. And I wanna make sure that I'm making the most out of that time. I don't want to be 
spinning the stuff that has vegetable matter because I'm so afraid like with Mars how you said you had that Rami fiber right that was super special that you don't want to ruin it right but then what happens is, is you spend your life spinning this stuff with like vegetable matter or you know it's something that you got real cheap you know and so you figure well if I mess it up oh well um and so then you know you're you're not making that time and space for that for that special fiber right so I, I figured out that I could probably do about like 30 more Stephen West shawls for the rest of my life if I did nothing else, okay? Or that I could probably do like 50 more socks or something like that. And so once, once I had this idea, I decided that, you know what? Um, the things that are important to me, I'm gonna finish like the quilt. The things that are not important to me, I'm going to release into the world. And then I have this special fiber from, you know, Peru that I got on my honeymoon and it's been sitting and sitting and I'm not giving that fiber its, its respect. You know what I mean? It's been sitting in this plastic bin in my closet. It's, you know, it's not, it's not being touched. It's not being worn. It's not being used. And so like with, you know, Grace's apron, right, that when there are things that we love, and, and we care about them, we want them to be used like our favorite baby blanket, right? Or our favorite pair of jeans. And so I really want the things that have the most amount of joy to be what I'm using in that one hour. And so I just, I encourage all of you, figure out how much time does it take you to actually do something? And is your time worth, you know, spending on that, you know, um, bulk fiber that you got for free because you're afraid to touch the good stuff or use the good stuff? And then, hey, guess what? If you have a couple of years left over, you can always use the stuff with vegetable matter. <laughs> At least you spend your time, you know, doing, doing, using, use the good china, use the good china. Yeah. That's, my, that's my tip. No, absolutely. Okay, so the next question we have is, what advice do you have for new spinners? And I think we kind of touched on that a little bit at the end of the last one, but um, do you have any sort of like more specific beginner advice for new spinners? I know we have a few in the chat today. Sure, sure. So I really thought about this because I wanted to make sure that I was giving concrete advice, right? Um, and so the first, because no matter how much I'm going to tell you this, <laughs> I don't practice it myself. So there's my cat, Oscar, the one that inspired the quilt. Um, but that over there is a skein that I spun. So it's, you know, it was it went um, into a sweater that, that I made for, for my husband, but I did not tie my skein in four places, okay? So I don't care how how tight you think you're tying your knots. I don't care like how gentle you think you're going to wash that skein. Just please, <laughs> for the love of the time that you can save and spinning that stuff, that that prized fiber, just tie your skeins in at least four spots, okay? You're going to you're, you're gonna do it once and you're going to be like, you know, a lot of she knew what she was talking about, but just trust me on this one, okay? Just tie it in four spots, <laughs> at least, at least four <laughs> spots. Um, I do have two more. I, I tried to think of three. Would you like, would you like the other yeah, two? Yeah, go for it, go for it. Okay, okay. All right. So the other, the other point, if you're a beginner, whether, you know, spinning in life, whatever, um, that there's no yarn fleece, okay? And that um, whatever you do, whether it's, you know, in your, in your free time, right? Obviously, professionally, you may have to do things that we don't enjoy. Um, but when you have this time carved out for yourself as a, a fiber person, um, you know, let, let joy guide you, okay? So if you're working with something that you don't like, you know, like these, um, this, this fiber here, um, if, you don't, if you don't like something, it's okay to not like something about it and to stop it and to move on to the things that make you happy. Um, but, you know, to, to do things that make you happy is going to make you see a project through all the way to the completion, right? So like, if there's something that's frustrating, you maybe go ask somebody to help you so that you can get through that wall. But definitely um, letting, letting joy guide what you do is, is going to be, I think, um, something that makes you just enjoy the process even more. Um, and then the last thing is that um, mistakes are part of the process, okay? So like when someone says, what do I have to do to get better? You have to make mistakes, like you have to, like it's part of it, you know? Like if you are going to tie your shoes, you have to make mistakes tying your shoes, you know, or you can wear Velcro, right? So like you can make mistakes with knitting or you can just go buy a sweater. You can make mistakes with weaving or you can just go buy a dish towel, right? So um, part of it is, is making the mistake um, and then trying to figure out why. Now, if you don't know why you made the mistake, then you can ask someone that is a little bit more knowledgeable and experienced. And, and generally that's a good way to get um, through the mistake but it's, it's part of the process. And so the more mistakes 
that you make, the better at, at it you'll get. And if you look at anyone that is experienced and, and able to make things, um, and, you, and you ask them, how many mistakes have you made to get to this point? I'm sure they'll give you a laundry list of them. So what you're looking at when you see success is someone that did not stop because of mistakes. Yeah, it's, it's mistakes and just the hours. You just have to put in the time to practice and the muscle memory will develop over time. And it's just one of those things. Like with pretty much anything else in life, you, you're not going to be great overnight. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're right. Uh, just making mistakes is totally the way to learn. <laughs> Okay, so the next question, what is the most precious or most soulful fiber stash that you have? Um, I definitely think that it's, it's a combo between, like I said, that alpaca from Peru that I was able to, to smuggle out. Um, I, haven't, I haven't touched it yet, um, just because of the memory of going on my honeymoon. Um, but I also have my, my cat Oscars for the... Um, I, I basically had the vet shear him one last time before, af after he died. And um, I'm saving it because I don't know what I want to do with it. Like I, up over here, let me see if I can turn this without, if you can see up on top. When I first spun um, his fiber, you can see that little gray tapestry cat. Um, my spinning teacher, the, the lady that taught me how to spin, she's like the, the, the master um, spinner in, in Rochester that teaches everybody how to spin. She wove that for me um, with his fur. So like his, his fur is, is in there. Um, but to me, you know, when I miss him, what's nice, cause you know, he was like my best friend. So for those of you that have like an animal best friend, you just know they're like, like I've met millions and millions of cats, but this, this cat was like my dude, you know? And so when I miss him, what I like to do um, it's a little bit weird, but I'll, I'll spin a little bit of his fur and then I'll make like a little bracelet up from the yarn. And then I have him with me, you know, as my, as my little buddy. And then when it breaks, I can just spin some more and, you know, so. <laughs> well, that's, that's such a sweet idea. Um, yeah, those are two really good, two really good uh, pieces of self stash right there. Um, okay, so the last question we have for this interview portion is what is your favorite spinning or hand spun project so far that you've done to date? Mm, I think it's probably the the Wizard of Oz um, Shaw one behind me. So here I can I'm gonna grab it. So this this one, like I said, it's it's my favorite. Maybe I can just kind of show it from from far away so you can see. Yeah. It's amazing. So, and then like, can you see the little, the little charms jiggling? <laughs> Love it. But what are the charms exactly? I can't tell from okay. here. Yep. So okay. I'll, I'll show you. So um, let's see if I can, if I can go to the overhead so I can talk about it. Now, again, this one was idea driven. So it really just was so much fun to do both from the spinning perspective, as well as the knitting perspective. Um, so each, each part of it, was like a different character or scene from the Wizard of Oz. So over here, and like, okay, so like not not only did I like doing this, right, as far as like this part goes, but <laughs> this is again just like I don't I didn't realize that other people's brains don't work like mine until the other day when I had a question with my uh, conversation with my husband, and I'm like, does your brain work this way? And he was like, nope. <laughs> um, so like I saved every single you know, commercial yarn and like I documented what what I did with it because in my mind I think, well, what if I teach a workshop someday and someone is gonna ask me like, what did I do, right? Like when I was making the yarns or putting it together. So this is just kind of how I, I think about um, these projects. But what I did was I took these commercial yarns and then I did these blends. So I don't know if you can see, I'll, I'll hold it up real close, but um, it says like mix number one and then one, three, four. Okay. And then it says like mix number two, one, three, three. Or, and so um, I, I labeled what the commercial yarns were and how many strands of each I was holding together at the same time. And so I was basically coming up with like a sketch, if you will, of what the yarns were gonna look like before I did it. And I did this like workshop um, kind of webinar series called Ask Alana About where I documented the process of the actual yarn creation. And so that part was super fun because I got to incorporate teaching into it. Um, but then like up over here, this was the final total yarn. So I used a lots of mohair and fuzzy textural yarns to get that like Karen Terrier kind of fluff. 
Um, then over here, this is the somewhere over the rainbow part, right? So these are all yarns that I dyed. Um, then this part was really challenging to me because I've never worked with resin or shrinky dinks before, but I wanted to capture the tornado part. So I have the coil over here. This is the, the tornado. So hopefully he'll come into focus, right? So there's my, my tornado. Um, but I had, I had the, the picket fence that was flying in the window. I had Auntie M that was flying in the window. So those were all shrinky dinks that I had to figure out how the heck to like, you know, make it look like these realistic components. And then there's the, the Wicked Witch. Okay. Yep. Yep. The cow. <laughs> yep. And then I had the, the house. Yeah. Um, and then I had the, the ruby slippers on the Wicked Witch of the East, the yeah. yellow brick road. I had um, ribbon from the scarecrow that I, I pulled apart. So that was like super fun to like tear ribbon and then just knit with it. So I didn't actually spin it. Um, I have the, there we go. There's the, the um, Tin Man with some copper beads. Oh yeah. And I thought this one was fun. Um, so this is the line. So it looks kind of plain, but you can see that there's a mistake in there with like the dyeing. And I thought that that required courage to use yarn that was dyed erroneously. Um, and leave it in. So that's that's my my wow. nod to courage. Um, and then this over here uh, is the poppy field. So it's got like the field of poppies. And then this part was super fun. So I made these little flying monkey beads with like feathers that I dyed. That. And my cat Glenn was all about that and chewing on them. Yeah. Then I have the the Wicked Witch um, Glenda with some fuzzy pink mohair to give it that like little little um. Halo and then the, the Emerald City. So I think to me that's probably been the most rewarding because of the, again, the idea behind it and having it be idea driven. And the whole thing like just tells us, tells the whole story, really. Like there's nothing, um, nothing missing from that. No, that's awesome. All right. So that's the end of the interview portion. I'm gonna pass you over to Grace to do the Q and A. I'm loving, I love that shawl. I'm so, everything you've said so far is so fascinating, Alana. I'm just fantastic. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not from, not talking. I've now got a frog in my throat. <laughs> no worries. So we've got a couple of really good questions. And if there's any more questions that people have, um, pop them in the chat and I'll just pick up on them. But um, Deborah Hutton was, was asking about the, the drum carder in the background. Mm -hmm. She'd like to know a little bit more, a little bit about more about the details of that bad boy. Um, yep, it's a, it's a Patrick Green drum carter. Um, and so I got it um, secondhand. And um, it's one of those things where to me, the tools that I use as a fiber artist are really important because it's like a chef using a butter knife when you're trying to, you know, chop vegetables. <laughs> um, so I like to just have one or two tools for like each of the, um, stages or phases of whatever it is I'm creating, but I want them to be, you know, the best for the job. And so this, this drum carter is just like the best. And I think um, the, the brother company took over it, but it does a really good job with blending. So if I'm going to do more of like a novelty style, that wouldn't be the drum carter to do. But if you want really smooth, consistent um, bats, especially when I'm working with color and I really want to get things super, super well blended. That's that's the go-to tool. Is it an electric one or is it by hand? No, nope, electric. electric. Yeah, here and it's got. I mean, it's it's got it's got a lot. That's how like, but you can hear it's got it's got the motor and everything. So yeah, you don't wow. you don't, you don't want it, you don't want it to be going without without um you know when you're, when when there's a kid or an animal around. So it's got a lot on it. Yeah. Glenn. Because my cat Glenn likes to go up there, so. Oh, big. well, it's kind of got any a sort of a square thing on the front, so they'll just fit themselves in and then rub their faces against all the sharp things. Oh, tell me how I know. <laughs> um, and then Ashley has asked, um, what is the most what what has been the most difficult project to translate from thought to reality? Um, tips on powering through or resetting to get back to the joy of it. Yes. Um. So. It was probably the first time that I did a sweater because I never knit a sweater. And I'm one of those people that, you know, has a very, um, I don't want to, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, um, but just like, just because I don't know what I'm doing, that doesn't mean I'm going to go like balls to the wall with this idea, you know? And so I've never, I've never made a sweater before. I never read um, a pattern for doing sweaters. 
Like I didn't know anything about this. So I basically went to a tailor. I had them um, take my measurements. And then I figured, well, if I can figure out a gauge swatch, then I can like count how many stitches I'm gonna need. And it just, yeah, it was, it was bad. Um, it took me a long time to figure out how to even write a sweater pattern that would fit my body. Yeah. And then in the spinning, I did a super fine merino. It was very lightly spun. So just so you can see here, most of my spinning early on, like looked like this, okay? This was like one of my first early spinning and you can see how underplied it was. Mm -hmm. So that when I put this in a sweater, it just self-destructed. I mean, it wasn't even this yarn, like the, the yarn that I had, you know, in my, in my sweater was like super fuzzy, fluffy, and the, the grist was inconsistent. So for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, like some yarns were like super dense, tight and thin, and others were like thick. And it wasn't even like a cute novelty feature. Um, it didn't sit well. It wasn't like formed. I mean, just like everything was bad about it. And I kept it as like my counter example of what to do for workshops. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to just put this out into the world and it's going to make someone happy. And, you know, one of my friends was like, yes, I'll buy it from you. And I'm like, great, good. And like, it just went on. So the joy was that I knew it was going to make someone else happy. So if you are really unhappy with something, um, you can either rip it out and do something else with the yarn. Um, if you make something and you're not happy, because I have a ton of things that I've made that I don't like, there are other people that I know you might think that they're weird. Like, why do you like this thing that I do not like? But you know, they, they might like it and like, believe them, right? Like, I'm sure you've seen something someone else has made and you're like, that's gorgeous. And they're like, oh, I can't, I can't look at this anymore. You know, get, get this away from me. And so, um, you know, find someone that will give it more love than you. And that's okay too. That's lovely. I love, I love that. You know, it's, Sort of like they were, you were saying, you know, just release it, just like give it away. Yeah, yes. I love it. I love it a lot. Sorry to interrupt, but I want us to make sure we have the, the best view of Alana possible. I want, I think the focus for your face oh, is probably somewhere else in the, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> It'll come back to you in a second because I, oh, I know that can be sometimes. There we go. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> there you are. So um, thanks for that, and um, thanks, Mars. Um, I thought she, I thought she had an old beauty filter on her. You know that blur background blur thing that all these fancy people have. I'm not, I don't know how that works. <laughs> um, so Laura uh, Lindman had a good question. Um, how's your cashmere progress going? So are you working with um, cashmere at the moment? Have you got a project with that? I'm not entirely mm -hmm. sure. Oh, maybe it was from my my workshop. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So. So I did a workshop on, like I said, it was called um, the organized spinner. And so I um, was challenging people. I said to them, you know, like with, you know, Mars and her special fiber, don't, don't leave the cashmere in the plastic bin, in your closet, on the bottom. So someone is calling me to task on it. So thank you. Thank you for holding me accountable. <laughs> um, so what I'm doing is I'm working my way through my work in project, uh, work in progress projects. Um, and then once, once I'm done, right? So once I have no more work in progresses that are not like actively being worked on, like ones that are just like sitting in drawers waiting to be done, I'm going to do a very um, mindful sort of de-stashing and um, I'm trying to think of the word, like kind of inventory check, okay? And so what, what I'm going to be using as like my guiding um, thinking here is I want my art space to be a studio. I want it to be a place that when I walk in, I'm inspired to create immediately. I do not want it to be a closet. And so when I start to think of my space as a closet, because this yarn is beautiful and that fiber is beautiful and I start to accrue a stash, then it becomes overwhelming. And I stop um, like wanting to create because I'm so overwhelmed by what I have. So I want to work to a place where if the cashmere is something that I want to use and not leave in the plastic bin, that it's going to be front and center and it's going to be right next to me so that when I see it, I can just go straight to working on it as opposed to like out of sight, out of mind. And so at this point, I have about, I think like 10 or 15 projects on my work in progress list. Like I said, I'm doing that two for one in 2021 challenge. So I'm hoping to get rid of, of that list. And then I'm gonna literally go through everything in my stash, including that cashmere. And if that cashmere does not speak to me and you know I don't have a project for it, I'm just gonna release it, let it bring somebody else joy. They're gonna be like, oh wow, I got this in a D-stash. Can you imagine, you know, this great fiber? It's gonna hopefully make them happy. And now I'm gonna have the space 
so that I can set up my, you know, spinner, I can set up my loom, I can set up my tools so that when I walk into the space, I can just sit down and create and not be overwhelmed with stash. So thank you for, for holding me accountable to that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Laura was actually recommending your, um, your organized spinner um, class. Uh, she was like, this is fabulous. So um, I, uh, I definitely am not that type of spinner. I think I would get super overwhelmed with the amount of work. <laughs> But that's the thing, like there's actually so much, so many different types of people and so many different ways of working. Um, I, there was so many people who were absolutely amazed at your level of organization and fascinated by the, how your brain works. So um, I have another question. And, oh, Kim also said it wasn't very unusual for people to come in looking for people to spin dog hair and stuff. And I think Bernadine actually who's here today, she does a lot of spinning with dog hair with um, um, Irish guide dogs for the blind. So they'd get like puppies and then they'd have to give them away, but they'd, she'd make a little heart out of their, out of their fur for them to keep as a little memory. I remember her talking to me about that. And um, then Jennifer asked, I think this might be the final question. Um, what is your favorite fiber to spin? Do you have a favorite? Um, I. I know what I don't like. <laughs> um, I, li I like I like um, fibers that when I'm touching them, like they feel good to my hands. And so it could be silk, right? It could be um, you know merino or the finer fibers. But I like I like fibers that you know they they draft easily. But um, you know I also like color. So I don't I don't enjoy spinning um, neutrals or you know white fiber. I love I love color. And, and I think, again, because I'm so product driven and I really try to have um, something in mind before I start to sit down to spin, that I know if I'm going to enjoy the end product, just what I'm using in my hands, making it to that stage, it's just the, the joy of the entire process. So yeah. it's not like one specific fiber, it's just seeing seeing that fiber go on to the next stage to then turn into the product that that i'm envisioning for it it's like it's like it's growing up <laughs> growing up and turning into your little baby oh so sad <laughs> and then if you hate it you're like okay go now that your time has passed and go make someone else happy <laughs> exactly exactly so um so yeah, I think that's all the questions that we have at the moment. Steph just mentioned, um, I found this through Laura's recommendation and the organized spinner class, even though I was there when Alana got her master's spinner certificate, certificate, didn't know you'd started teaching. So you've got a, you've got a number of courses. Um, I, I wonder, do you want to talk a little bit about the type of courses that you have? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so at the moment, um, I probably have about five or six classes posted on my, my website. Um, and a lot of the workshops, the way that I run them is I'll do a Zoom format similar to this, where I'll run them live, I'll record them, and then I'll put them up for viewing and, and um, you know, purchasing and registering for after the fact as well, so that it kind of meets everybody's, you know, schedule so that, um, like the organized spinner, if you want to take it now, you can take it now, um, but it's also unlimited access, so you can go on, you can take it and go back and watch it, you know, again, when there's a point that you want to revisit. So mm -hmm. it's, it's nice. It's unlimited access, unlimited views um, after pur purchasing it. But um, at the moment, I have um, a workshop on spinning for socks. So if you want to see, you know, the process of picking fiber, like that's best for socks and, you know, figuring out twist angle and like all of the technical components of what goes into a sock. And, you know, that, that, that is what that workshop is for. I have um, ones that are geared towards dyeing as well, like creating a digital dye notebook so that, one thing that I didn't talk much about, but over here. <laughs> here I'll down. Oh, I love this project. So, so yeah, so this, is, this has been um, my, my life's work, um, you know, for the better part of the past 13 years where I've been trying to figure out after I did those gloves, how to match um, the color on, that we see on a screen in a picture to, to yarn. And so like I had to be very meticulous when I was, you know, doing the, the dyed swatches. So you can see I have my little, you know, notes there and all of that, but it's kind of hard to keep everything 
like all organized on these little floss bobbins. And so I have this, this workshop um, that basically teaches you how to inventory your dyes, your dye recipes, um, your inspiration, mood boards, all of that in, in one place. So it's kind of like the, the dyer's version of like the organized dyer and then I have the organized spinner. Um, and I have, you know, more, more technical ones like spinning for consistency, how to calculate enough fiber for a project. And I'm going to be putting up, I think I have like either three or four more workshops that I taught at, um, at, Rhine, at Rhinebeck virtually this past year. So now like there's been enough time that has passed. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upload, upload those as well. And as soon as I'm done with my dive book, which like fingers crossed is going to be by the summer, um, I'm planning on doing at least like a workshop a month with regard to spinning because in my brain right now, I probably have at least like 30 workshops, if not more that I want to cover and, you know, on topics and to make it available to people. Um, but I also do private lessons as well. So there's a lot of people that um, who've never spun before that I've taught like straight beginners, people that need help troubleshooting why is their wheel not working to people that, you know, want to get kind of like a consultation on how to spin for a project. So that's kind of like all on my website. And can I say all of these classes are incredibly valuable, like as in the cost is incredibly approachable. I think personally, I was I was looking at them and I was like, oh, my God, for the amount of information you have, well worth it, I think. Absolutely well worth it. So and just because you mentioned the books, do you want to talk a little bit about the um, so you've got a new book coming out, but you have a book that I keep banging on about. <laughs> Do you just want to mention it a little bit? And uh, then sure. I think we'll um, we'll move on to our giveaway, possibly. Okay. Um, so yeah, so so as the um, culmination of the spinning certificate um, course that I went through, it was a six year a six year program. Um, and then for those that were, you know, <laughs> not deterred by the 250 hours a year um, of, this, of this dedication, you could um, pursue what they refer to as the Master Spinner Certificate. And so it's basically like a thesis or like um, what they refer to as an in-depth study that you could propose. And then for the better part of two years, you would pursue this um, idea of yours. You'd have to have 20 samples. You'd have to have these finished um, objects to go with it. And so based, based off of my in-depth study, I wrote, I wrote this book. So it's called A New Spin on Color. And it basically um, you know, shows you how if you are starting with one, one you know, braid of, of wool that's dyed. So in through the book, I used this one right there, right there, right the, um, like these colors over here. And so I just basically go through and show people all the different ways you can approach working with color specifically in space dyed top. And so um, I just, I feel like really strongly about self-publishing because um, I didn't want parts or bits of it to get cut, which I knew that if I went through a publishing house, you know, they might have like shrunken it down. So, so in the book, I really tried to give as many um, tips and tricks as I thought would help both the novice beginner when they're trying to think about color um, so people that might not be comfortable with like color theory and stuff like that to give those people ideas, but also for the more experienced spinners who understand yarn construction, it also helps them understand, oh, okay, like if you're going to spin for a sweater, for example, right, let's say the sweater, because we're talking about mistakes. Mm -hmm. So let's see over here, this, this sweater, this sweater over here, right, that's what you're envisioning. But come to find out, you know, you're getting like all of these different versions on the bottom. Well, what can you do as a spinner to avoid that or to do it more with intention? And so I, I'd like to think that the, the layout and the illustrations and the examples that I give really help people um, kind of understand what's going to happen before they do it. But it's also a workshop that I teach called um, 12, 12 plus ways to approach spinning painted tops. So you could basically go through the entire book and use it as like a workshop model. Um, and I highly encourage anyone that, that has a copy of the book to do that because I feel like in doing so, you, you really get a lot of information that just reading about it doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, and also I have a little digital dye um, notebook called Dying to Get the Colors You Want. It talks a little bit about the process that I use in, in creating um, these gloves but it doesn't necessarily give you exact dye formulas and that's, and that's what I'm working on now. So over the summer, so this is like super exciting, I'm going to have, I would say the better part of like 2,100 different dye recipes 
so that if you pick a color from a photograph, right? Like, so, okay, this is like a little version of my book, but like, let's say you wanted to get this red color, okay? Um, you would be able to take the red color from the image and based on like my system, I, I would um, have it set up so that I'm gonna have like a little kind of color picker, color search, um, you know, uh, program set up so that you can then just click on the color you want you would input the amount of dye you want to dye and literally with like in seconds you'll have the formula of what you need to dye that color and so I just think it's going to be a huge game changer um, because all of, of all of the dyes that I use it's only maybe like I think I use 21 different dye colors as my primaries as opposed to just like a single brand of red yellow and blue but with those 21, like I said, you can make almost 2,100 different dye colors and they will be um, a match. But what's, what's super exciting is that in this book, one of the things that I did that I can't wait to share with people, um, I asked a bunch of fiber artists, what bases do you use as a fiber artist, right? So some people said I use yarn, I use, you know, wool, I use like the fiber, the fleece. So I, I, I dyed over 38 different um, fibers right, for, for this, but all using the same color formula. And so it's so fascinating to me to see how the color shifts when the same dye formula. So if you think of just something even like taking a green that's made of 50% blue and 50% yellow and putting them together, if you use it on 100% wool yarn versus if you dye, um, you know, 100% silk, right? Or what if you dye that and other fibers that were really interesting in it, was like um, raffia I dyed. I didn't know you could use acid dyes with that, so that was fun. I dyed my cat Glenn's fur with it, so he he made a little um, debut in the book. So just, it's amazing what you could do with, with you know, the acid dyes. And again, I know I'm going off on tangents because I'm so excited about talking it. about it, but I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited to be you able love to it. That's it fun. Um, and I just want, Jessica just asked, uh, where did you take the spinning course? Is it an online course? No, so it's it's up in Canada, um, and it's about three hours northeast of um, Toronto. So it's you have to go there for nine days, and it, it is challenging. So what I was hoping to do again, like once the dye book um, project is over, um, I'm really hoping, and the and the organized spinner was kind of like the start of it, but I'm really hoping hoping to put together a series of workshops so that a person that would like to get all of the knowledge that I've I've gotten from going through the, the course, they'll be able to get it, but to do it at their own pace. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start off with like four workshops that would be what were topics and, and things that I thought were relevant in year one, and then kind of build it up in sequence. So mm, people cool. can do it along with me, they can do it at their own pace, but they'll be able to get all of that technical knowledge and information um, that I got. So everything from, you know, how to use different tools, like how do you get the most out of you know, hand carters, how do you chain ply, you know, with great success, um, you know, when do you use which drafting method for which fiber and oh, preparation wow. method and all of that. And you can get a lot of that information in the workshops that I already have, but I thought making it in more of like a sequential series type format would yeah. be, you know, really helpful, especially because not a lot of people I know that went through the program do virtual online teaching. So it would be <laughs> something pretty, pretty unique that people could get from me. Great. And just one last quick question before the giveaway. Um, what's what type of wheel do you use? I use an electric spinner. Ah. And so I started um, with a Susie Magicraft. Well, no, I started with the drop spindle, but then I got a Susie Magicraft um, and I loved it. And then I got a pocket wheel because I thought going to um, Guild would be easier than carrying the, the Susie. Mm -hmm. um, and then I fell in love with the Jensen production wheel with the finials and all of that. And I had it and I never used it, you know, because I got my Hanson electric spinner and that, you know, was just the thing that I used. So um, I got rid of my Susie and my pocket wheel earlier on. And then letting the Jensen production meal go was very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. However, it's what I used to get Glenn. So when you let things go from your stash, when you let things go from your life, just make sure that the thing that you let go, it's brought in with welcoming arms for something that much better. And I can tell you that I enjoy my cat Glenn, who's passed out over there. So I'm happy, Grace, whenever you give me the, the go ahead. Oh, you need to show, show me, show me, show me the cat. Show okay. me the cat. <laughs> you yeah kim says show us the cat everyone yeah yep so for those of you that don't know and love him yet i i encourage you to go to my instagram to see 
um, pictures of him. He really doesn't like to be held, so he might start it's to post. So grumpy. I love how he's trying to hide. There's Glenn. Oh, he's such a grumpy old. Oh, man. yes, he's, he's the best. I love him. Come for the spinning, stay for the cat. You got it, Emma. Yep, yep, you got it, you got it. To our recording and a huge thank you, Alana, for your answers to these questions. What a rich video. Um, I encourage you, if you love this kind of thing, share the YouTube video with your friends who are not able to make meeting this month. It will be well worth their time.